I have a feeling that today's episode is going to be a little bit what I did in my holidays, <laughs> like when you like like when you go back to school and everyone has to write their essay. Oh, by the way, someone got in touch the other day and said, "Oh, do you realise you didn't invent the term humble brag? It's been around for ages, and there's a book and everything." We are well aware of that. In fact, the first time humble brag came up was you pointing out the. Twitter of the person who is really into it. So yes. we don't think we invented humble brag, yes. just for the record. We just enjoy a good humble brag. <laughs> and and we are we are kind of we discuss it way too often. Yes. Although I believe you are probably the originator of the word hollow brag. Hollow brag, yes. Well I have another one that I want to spring on you. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and this is called the Brag Humble. Oh man. I, yeah. This is going to be trouble. This is going to be trouble. What is this? I, for a start, I quite like the name Brag Humble because it sounds, you know, he's is he bragging humble? Like, is he breaking bad? So I think is he bragging humble sounds kind of cool. Uh-huh. But but the Brag Humble is the opposite of the humble brag. Uh-huh. It contains both components but with different intent. So for a start, let's establish the humble brag is all, is all about <laughs> for, for those <laughs> oh, man. For, the, for those who may have missed it. <laughs> this is that... just what we need to throw more confusion into this thing. I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm already thanking you for this. <laughs> I get tweets from people. Uh huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. For the, for those who may have missed it, <laughs> the humble brag is about saying something that is ostensibly humble, but your real intent is to brag. Right. That's where your intent is in a humble brag, isn't it? It's okay. to brag. Right. That's what you're doing. Right. Do you agree? Yes. Are we agreed yes, on that? Yes, we are. We are agreed on this. All right. The brag humble. Uh huh. Is when you brag. But the intent of the brag is to increase the humility. Okay, I'm going to need an example of this. Okay, let me give you an example. As you know, I was recently in California. Uh And I was mainly in Berkeley, but one day I went to the other famous university in the area, which is Stanford. Mm -hmm. So I went went and spent the night in a hotel because I had an early meeting. Got up early and, uh, you know, got prepared and made my way to a meeting with an, a really famous, important person who I was, who I couldn't, can't believe I got to meet because he rarely meets with people, mm-hmm. a guy called Don Knuth. Mm-hmm. And in the world of computer science, I am bragging right now. Okay. Get it, you know, I went to his house. I spent hours with him. We, we filmed some things for Number File and Computer File. Uh, had, a great, had a great time with him. It was fantastic. Me and Don Knuth. Mm-hmm. Wow. And even at the end, he even said I had a really good time. I really enjoyed it. And I felt like a million dollars. I then went to, uh, I went to another meeting. And before my other meeting, I went to the bathroom Mm -hmm. and looked in the mirror. And there was this huge white streak going from the corner of my mouth, basically to all the way to my ear, really like I was like, like I was painted, like, you know, like Indian war paint. It was so prominent and i was like what on earth is that what's happened so i put my finger on it and tasted it because that's just what i do when i see <laughs> chem- chemicals <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and luckily l- luckily it wasn't point what it was was a huge streak of toothpaste <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so so clearly and i do remember that i and what had happened that morning is I had my electric toothbrush with me, but it had run out of power. So I brushed my teeth with it like a normal toothbrush, mm-hmm. which isn't a good idea with an electric toothbrush. Yeah, it, does, it did, doesn't, I, doesn't work satisfactorily. Doing yeah. That. And I was in a rush and I didn't look in the mirror because I'm rubbish. You know, when my wife's not around to look after me, I just look <laughs> rubbish and stuff. So basically, <laughs> I, spent, I spent my morning with the great man of computer science, you know, having this fantastic time with this enormous streak of toothpaste going all the way from my mouth to my ear. And he's too nice a guy to bring it up. He was a t- total gentleman. And I met his wife and everything. <laughs> and I must have looked like the biggest idiot of all time. Uh, uh, and there you go. That is a brag humble. Cause I, because the, int- the brag just increased the humbleness at the end. Okay. Where do you, where do you stand on this? Uh, I'm not impressed by that. But more, more importantly, <laughs> I, I need to know, how did you get the toothpaste in a streak going all the way up to your ear. Did, did you attempt to put the toothbrush in your mouth and you missed and you dragged it all along the side of your face? Is, uh, is this the scenario under which 
you had a streak of toothpaste running along the side of your face. I, I don't Look, understand. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's pretty impressive um, to miss your yes. mouth with the toothbrush. Like, I mean, that, I is that what I happened? Know. I don't know what that happened. That has to Who be knows? what happened. Who knows what happened? But it <laughs> I happened. think you know what happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It was I, I didn't, you know, who knows? That's what happened to me. So anyway, when it happened, I thought, oh, that's a good story. I have to tell Gray about it. And then I thought, I'm not humble bragging. I'm bragging humble. Bragging humble. Because I could have told you that story without the Don Knuth element, mm-hmm. and it just would be a, a story. Uh-huh. But it, but putting the brag in increased the humility. Do you not agree? It makes it it makes it more embarrassing. I don't know if it makes it more humbling. I, I, I'm 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 not sold on the brag humble. I think I think you're just going nuts with variations on the humble brag. <laughs> And this one is a bit of reaching for straws, if, if, I'm, if I'm being honest with you. I, I think this is just an embarrassing story made worse is, is what it is. That's, that's what the, this the, is. The, the more you say that, the more I think it works. The more you say, <laughs> yes, it's made worse, you know, it increases the embarrassment, the more uh-huh. I think I'm onto something here. Well, it's, we'll a brag, it's a brag humble. I think we will have to let the listeners decide. One of the, the main things from the last conversation was how YouTube handles sending people notifications uh, that new videos from the people they are subscribed to are out. So how, yes. how do people basically consume their YouTube? And tons of people got in touch to tell me about how on YouTube there is a section which is called, uh, I think it's called My Subscriptions or something like mm-hmm. that, which yeah. still has the old behavior of YouTube, which is where I think it just lists all of your channels and it shows which ones have new videos and which ones do not have new videos. And I was very much aware of this when we were having this conversation. This was not a new piece of information, but uh, I just wanted to point out as, as a little as a little minor thing that whenever you're talking about stuff with computers, you have to assume that the default action is basically what everybody does. Because yeah. so few people ever change the settings. I can't remember where it was, but I, I, I read some uh, some analysis uh, from app creators about how many people ever change any of the settings in their apps. And it is basically nobody. Certain kinds of people are completely blown away by that information because I'm the sort of person who is like, ooh, I downloaded a new app. Before I even see what it really does, let me look at all of the settings. What can I change? <laughs> How can I flip these switches? Ooh, maybe I want it this way. Maybe I want it that way. And I haven't even used the thing. And so the idea that most people just, oh, they go to YouTube and they never change any of the settings is sort of foreign. And for many of the people who are really into YouTube, the power users, that is also kind of foreign. But if something something is the default, you just have to assume that that is what everybody uses and the people who don't use the defaults are, are a vanishingly small percentage of the population. So even if there is a solution on YouTube, it is functionally irrelevant. So that was my only other piece of follow-up. You will be unsurprised to hear that I've, I'm more of a default kind of guy. I am not surprised at all by this, no. <laughs> I apologize. There's nothing to apologize for. You live a simpler and possibly better life. Less, <laughs> less frustrated life, perhaps. There was one more. There was one more thing I wanted to tell you about, and this uh-huh. I don't know where this fits into the show, mm-hmm. but I just wanted to tell you about it because it was on my mind. Uh-huh. I had I had a lot of spare time while I was away, sort of sitting alone in my hotel room, uh, washing toothpaste off my face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, one of the things one of the things I did because I'd heard it talked about so many times was mm-hmm. I watched the original keynote by Steve Jobs when the first iPhone was launched. Oh, really? You've never seen it before. I had never seen it before. How interesting. I, I'm, I'm assuming you've probably seen it multiple times in, when you say your nightly prayers to Steve Jobs before you go to sleep. But, yeah, that's what my uh, life is like. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I saw it, uh, I think I just saw it once. I think? highly recommend it. I highly recommend it to anyone to watch now because watching it now, mm-hmm. it is so much better. All the usual stuff aside, you know, he did a very good job. He was a good presenter. Um, it was, it was, you know, it was a good watch. But the thing that's so funny is when he first takes it out and starts doing things like swiping the screen mm-hmm. and like, you know, zooming in and zooming out with the pinch maneuvement. Mm-hmm. Like no one had seen that before. Mm-hmm. And it's like he's doing magic. Like the crowd 
gasp <laughs> like he says watch this and he like he swipes the screen and pinches it and zooms it and the crowd are like <gasps> what have you done this is amazing uh, and like and to see that now where you know even little kids do it to like tv screens because they just it's just an assumed thing that will happen mm-hmm. is really good fun mm-hmm. and to see something so recent but to see people react that way made it made it all worthwhile. Two thousand seven is that? I think that's right. Off the top no, of my head. I don't know. I have to look. Go it on. Up. Tap tap tap. Uh, no, tap tap tap. Fine. Click 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 click. Uh, Do your thing. Okay. Do fine. your thing. I haven't got much more to say about it. Just that I enjoyed it and I recommend it. And maybe you know. Yeah, it is two thousand seven. Have a watch. Um, the only thing I remember from that before he introduces, he says, "Oh, you know, we we've made uh, we've combined you know a phone and." An iPod and an internet communication device, I think is the way he phrases yeah. it or something like that. Yeah, I think it's that like internet communicator or something. Yeah, and it, yeah. yeah something like yeah, that. Something. Um, but the thing that I think is interesting about that little section is that the crowd, you can hear them respond very positively to the first two things, the phone and the iPod. But the internet communicator part is a bit more muffled. Where, where people are not super excited about that. And it's partly because you don't know the magic of this phone. You don't, you don't know yet how your whole life is about to be transformed by the fact that this thing is connected to the internet. Uh, you know, you haven't experienced that yet. And so you are excited about the things that you do know being combined. But it's not, it's not like, um, it's not obvious at the time that the biggest deal is that last part. It's not the first two parts. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's my uh, that's my only memory of uh, of the thing. So you recommend it for for people. I will see if I can find a link and put it in the show notes. Now, uh, I haven't got a particular plane crash corner, but I've got plane crash corner follow up mm-hmm. because a few people have sent me uh, a little bit about this. We talked about in the previous episode about how when a plane crashes, the logo of the plane can be. On display for all to see and that can be quite embarrassing for the company mm-hmm. and you talked about how that's a good thing because it makes the companies accountable for their wrongdoings mm-hmm. and things like that since then i have found out about and i did not know this was the case which makes me feel a bit silly because i'm supposedly a plane crash enthusiast it seems now um which is a weird way to describe yourself but anyway you are you are a <laughs> professional plane crash analyst i think is what we can say no, I, I consider myself more of an amateur plane crash analyst. There's ads on this podcast, buddy. At this stage, <laughs> you are a professional. I would consider myself more of a hobbyist when it comes to plane crashes, but this oh, yeah. is not relevant. <laughs> so, um, but what I have learned from people who are more knowledgeable than me mm-hmm. is that it has, is a common practice when a plane has a mishap for one of the first things the company does is either cover or paint over their logo like on on like basically on the wreckage so that all the pictures that inevitably get taken don't highlight what's going on wow and i've got i've got a link this was this was sent to us by a few people so apologies for not name checking you but uh you know who you are this was a a thai airways uh plane which skidded off a runway Mm -hmm. somewhere uh in bangkok it appears and oh wow kind of yeah, there's a picture of there's a picture of the plane kind of you know with on its belly looking you know looking a bit stricken, and they've basically just painted. It looks like it's been done in fo- it looks fake. It looks like it's been done in Photoshop. They've basically just gone with black paint and painted over their name and their logo everywhere so that. Yeah, what what this looks like is, uh, it is though someone has redacted the airplane. Someone has exactly. taken a black marker and just whoosh, right across the side and just scribbled over the tail fin. And as far as I'm concerned, that should be illegal. <laughs> this this should not be allowed to happen. Uh, oh, that is if awful. This is, if, if this is an illegal activity, does that mean you and I get to invent a name for it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Do you want to try to come up with a name for this? <laughs> I think aircraft redaction is quite a cool sounding term. Or maybe maybe brand redaction. I don't know. It feels like it, this this is broader than just airplanes trying to hide your brand when something bad has happened. But uh, yeah, although redaction does have that other use, so maybe we need to come up with a different word. Um, I don't know the other use for redaction. What is the other use for redaction? Well, you know, like like redaction is in like you know with confidential documents. I mean, there can be good reasons to redact information. You will put the link in the show notes so everyone can see this redacted plane. Yes, I will. I will. Lying on its belly, black marks all over its name and logo. 
cheating. They're cheating here. If you yeah. do the if you do the crime, you do the time. Mm-hmm. And that means having your logo plastered all over the internet. Yeah, that is but, that uh, is really awful to see. Well, I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. Uh anyway. I do. You, it's awful. You were you were outraged. I kind of thought Yeah, I think it's pretty I think it's probably not right, but uh yeah, it's pretty not right. Anyway, have a look, people. See what you think. Well, it's Christmas time, and that can mean only one thing, buying shaving products, probably for the men in your family. But this year, instead of some vacuum-packed shaving kit with branding that looks like it was designed for a Michael Bay movie, why not try one from our show sponsor, Harry's? Now, if you're listening to this podcast before December 14... 2014, there's an extra special Christmas deal to be had. I'll tell you about that in a second, but first, let me tell you why we like Harry's. Essentially, they're all about making your life easy and cool. No faffing around with locked cases at the shops, no tacky packaging, order online, get a great looking, sleek product that does the job spot on. I've got a Harry's kit myself, and although I do support that designer stubble that drives the fans crazy, I do shave around the edges using Harry's blades and they're doing a fine job. These blades are made in Germany so they must be good, like BMWs. Now they've got some Christmas offers on their website if you get in quick and the one I'd like to tell you about is $5 off a Winter Winston. All listeners can get in on this deal, old or new, go to harrys.com and enter the coupon code HIHOLIDAY. I don't know if that's case sensitive, but the way it's written here for me, uh, lowercase h, lowercase i, and then a capital H starting the word holiday, but it's all bunched together as one word. That's harrys.com and the code hi holiday. This offer expires on the 14th of December. You'll get five bucks off a nice little set here, including a razor, three blades, and a choice of shave cream or gel. Really good deal. It's win win. You've shown Harry's that you support our podcast and you've sorted out someone like maybe your dad's Christmas present for another year. Or at the very least, you're assured a nice clean shave for that kiss under the mistletoe. But seriously, thanks to Harry's for supporting our show and getting quick for that Christmas offer. If you're listening to the podcast sometime after Christmas, well, I hope you enjoyed your Christmas with a nice smooth shave. Now, another reason this may be a short show is we have spent so much time together lately. Yes. In fact, in fact, I would go so far as to say we're almost sick of each other. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would never get sick of you, Brady. I, I could we, never we, get sick of you. We even shared a bathroom for a week almost. Uh, yes, we did. Very. I think, I think we shared it very well. I, I think there were no problems. We did. We did. I joked about using your towel to dry myself, but I didn't ever do it. I, I assume that you didn't ever do it. <laughs> On my way back from California, we... Went to Alabama mm-hmm. and met with Destin from Smarter Every Day, Henry from Minute Physics, and uh, Dirk from Verisastium. And um, <laughs> so I'm, no, I'm never going to stop doing that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> we met with Derek from Veritasium. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Just that for guy. people who might not know in advance who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we obviously, we, we did this... Uh, random acts of intelligence show which we may talk about shortly mm-hmm. but in the week up building up to that we just like hung out in alabama mm-hmm. tell me about your trip over because i know you love a good i know you love talking about planes and travels and all the things that work you up how was your trip <laughs> over uh I, do, do i love talking about that stuff I, I don't know um you flew standby presumably yes i flew i flew standby and uh, i lucked out both times on this trip both going no. Going to America, I, I got the incredibly rare first class seat, <gasps> which is like an amazing space pod from the future. Uh, so that was that was quite enjoyable. And if you ever fly first class, it's almost sad when the flight is over, even if it is a transatlantic flight. I feel like I uh, could live in that first class cabin. I want to kick you in the shins now. That's very mature of you. You're lucky, man. This is what makes all of the stress and anxiety of flying standby occasionally worth it but that is I, exceedingly rare they uh, never upgrade me i'm always stuck in the back with all the cattle <laughs> but, but you fly all, you fly in. all the time don't you have some miles program or something? I have yeah no idea well, that's what i keep thinking i keep thinking they're going to come up to me and say mr heron you have been chosen you get to go into the pointy end in the space pod with cgp gray uh-huh 
But never, never happens. Never. Never happens. I think you shoved, you shoved have in a the terrible back. Miles program. Then I'm sorry. Or maybe they see that toothpaste all over my face and say we can't let this guy up the front. <laughs> He that doesn't is, look the business. That is also quite possible. So you arrived all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed after sitting in the space pod? Uh, yeah, as much as it is possible to arrive bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, because travel is terrible, obviously. Uh, and then on the way back, uh, leaving from DC, coming back to the UK, I lucked out again and got business class, uh, and I was able to have a little sleep on the airplane, uh, which is very nice, because then I don't occasionally think about how terrifying flying is. And if you're unconscious... You don't, it's it's a much shorter experience. After flying first class, was business class like a real come down for you? <laughs> like, no. oh no, I can't believe I have to fly business class. Oh, disgusting. <laughs> it wasn't. And I often think that first class is only for people for whom money just doesn't matter at all. Because <laughs> first class is... It's like if you look up the prices sometimes for, say, like a London to JFK or a London to D.C. trip, first class tickets will be three times as much as a business class ticket. And business class tickets already run, you know, five to ten thousand dollars. It's like those first class seats are just crazy expensive sometimes. But I am of the opinion that the first class seats are not that much better. That the business class and first class on many airplanes is very comparable. So this is only for people for whom the marginal value of of dollars is just irrelevant. They're they're people like, I have billions of dollars and I will pay tens of thousands of dollars to be very slightly more comfortable because money is just completely irrelevant to me. So even if you are like a millionaire, first class doesn't necessarily make any financial sense. You have to just have a crazy amount of money or have a company that doesn't mind just spending a crazy amount of money to fly first class. So no, business class business class was not like some terrible come down. It was still great to be able to fly business class. Um, I think the only way first class would be worthwhile was if I had Scarlett Johansson personally delivering me peanut M&Ms and <laughs> And back issues of NTSB crash reports while I was si- while I was singing, read my mind over the intercom to everyone else on the plane. <laughs> then, then you would pay the thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> I would consider it under those circumstances and those circumstances only. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. That's good to know. I'll see if I can arrange that. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on your upgrade. I'm sorry about saying I'd kick, I wanted to kick you in the shins. I don't, and I am happy for you and all that sort of stuff. Meanwhile, my flying experience involved them saying, sorry, your camera bag's too big. You're going to have to check it under the plane. And Ooh. I was unwilling to put all my camera equipment under the plane. Yeah, so I literally had to, I had to take all my cameras and equipment out and just like hold it in my arms <laughs> for the flight. <laughs> Cradling like, them like a baby. I was. I was just cradling all these cameras and lenses and stuff. It was like I was like some kind of uh, Canon sponsored hobo. <laughs> That's a good mental image there for yeah. everybody to look around and see. Ooh, look at those impressive lenses that person has. So I didn't have such a nice flying experience. But I'm sorry. What else can you tell me about travel? Oh, I do. I do you... have. I do have a minor frustration, which is kind of follow up from I think the last episode. Uh, I don't remember. One of the recent episodes, anyway, we were talking about not reading the instruction manuals. I think this was the last one. And we both came to the conclusion that instruction manuals need to be presented in pictograph form. That the uh, the IKEA instruction manual is perfect. Or the instructions that came with the Blue Yeti with little cartoons showing you how to use the microphone. This is about... Uh, this is about what I'm acceptable. Uh, or this is about what I will tolerate for yeah. reading. Um, you have to be kind of at caveman proof. <laughs> yeah, caveman proof, Egyptian hieroglyphics, very clear images showing what's going on. Yeah. And so there's this, there's this thing that irritates me at airports. So I, I guess on this trip, I, I hit four airports. Yeah, that's right. London, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., and Huntsville. And then yeah. back again through the bunch. And... I do not understand why particularly international airports don't have gigantic signs in the security area showing you what to do with what. Shoes off, laptops out. What are the things that you need to do? Because they're not the same everywhere for everyone who is, say, traveling through a place like London Heathrow. And I get annoyed that the security guards get annoyed 
that people don't just magically know what to do. And they have instructions, but they are usually tiny and they are very usually like written instructions as well. And I just think, no, no, no. There needs to be on the back wall as big as you can possibly make it a picture of a person with their iPad either in their backpack or out of their backpack, right? This is what we need to have. Just it I, drives uh, me crazy. I'm kind of, I don't know. I don't know exactly where I stand on that. I, I, people are at their dumbest in airports. Yeah, that's why you need to help them with gigantic yeah. pictures. Because it's like they've just like stepped off an alien spaceship, and they don't, and they're like they're looking around, dazed and confused, and they stand in stupid places, and they're like they don't know what they're doing. So people do need help, but I don't know, I don't know because. I don't know whether big pictograms will help, or I don't imagine that even help that much because people are just too dumb in airports. But also, the problem is like technology changes really quickly, and like, do I take my laptop out? Yes. Do I take an iPad out? Uh, yes. Do I take a Kindle out? No. Do I like? And everything's like you know. And do I take my shoes off? And sometimes they say yes, and sometimes they say no, depending on the shoes. Mm -hmm. And it gets really, really complicated really really quickly and i think the kind of the subtleties involved here either need to be removed or don't lend themselves to pictograms just just tell everybody shoes off because it's going to be faster if everybody just takes shoes off as opposed yeah. to oh me or no not me or are you sure i don't need to take these shoes off right that, that is just yeah. that causes huge delays any kind of uncertainty do the shoes go in a tray do they have to go in a different tray to the computer yeah. can the computer go in the same tray as my thing and like yeah. So this is why I think if if you can't reduce the instructions to pictograph levels, you cannot expect those instructions to happen. So if you're going to have a picture <laughs> of a dude taking his shoes off, everybody takes their shoes off. iPad in or out of the bag, everybody's iPad in or out of the bag. Any tablet like thing is in or out of the bag. You just you just make that call and don't don't have the oh is it a Kindle is it not a Kindle question. That's just that is just terrible and. I, I'm a total pro at that now, though, man. You should see me. I'm amazing. One seamless movement. Uh, yeah, I, I do a lot of pre-preparation for the security line at the airport <laughs> because – and I look around and I always feel like, like I don't travel a lot, but surely other people must know that when you get to the front of the line, they want you to take things out of your pockets. Like if you've ever yeah, been they, in an they, airport – and they look stunned. They're like, "Oh, I had I had no idea this was going to happen. Yeah. I've been I've been I've been watching a hundred people in front of me do it for the last ten minutes, but I didn't think I was going to have to do it." Yeah. So, so my my advice always for traveling when you're going through security is you need one of two things. You need one either to be wearing a jacket that has pockets that you can zip up, or you need an empty front pocket on your suitcase that also has a zipper. And so as Good long call. as you, yeah, one of those two things, while you are online, you take everything out of your pockets and just shove it into one of those two things. And usually for me, that's my jacket. So just everything goes in the jacket, zip up the pockets and put it through the x-ray machine. No problem. Man, that's good advice. That should have been, that should have been the 11th commandment when Moses came down off the mountain, because that is a good call. It, it makes things, it makes things so much easier. But the iPad is the really tricky one, the in or out one, because I asked several security agents and I got different answers about, no, of course not. And yes, of course, always iPad in or out. And uh, this is also my first time flying in America after the, uh, the rule change that they've just made about having electronics on during takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, if you were aware of that, but it, it used to always be they used to have the big lie where it was like, oh, if anybody leaves their iPhone on, this whole plane is going down, right? So everybody has to turn yeah. off all their electronic devices during takeoff and landing, which was manifestly wrong, right? People don't even know how to turn off their iPhones. I mean, just people just don't. So obviously it was okay. But they, yeah. they changed the rule. But now they have this very confusing announcement, which is uh, it's something like, please stow away all large electronic devices and small electronic devices can be used during land landing and takeoff. So where's the line here, by the way? Like, where does an iPad Mini fall, and an iPad, and a Kindle, and a? Well, this is so. The first time I, this happened to me, I thought, oh well, look at me. I'm here with an iPad, and I have the regular full iPad Air size one. And I thought, oh, well, clearly this is a large electronic device, so I'm going to put it in my bag. But then I look around and I notice other people while we are taking off are reading on their iPads, and then I feel like a sucker sitting there being bored with nothing to do. <laughs> And so the next couple of flights, I had it out, but I felt like I needed to be kind of sneaky about it. But the, the flight attendants never said anything. So I thought, oh, OK, I guess an iPad counts as a small electronic device. 
clearly doesn't seem like it should to me. But that that uh, that announcement is not helpful. What is large? What is small? I don't understand. They should just say laptops away, tablets are fine. I think that's a lot clearer. But I, I don't I don't know, Gray, if you're going to be engendering a lot of sympathy and love from the listenership as you talk about your problems with which electronic devices you can have out <laughs> while flying first class from England to America. <laughs> Well, I only had my iPad with me. I didn't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so wh- while we while we continue talking about your millionaire lifestyle, <laughs> <laughs> I wish <laughs> um, I see I see the next item. On the oh list no, here. you're not going to bring this up now. <laughs> this is this is a terrible time to bring this up. I, I shouldn't I, put I, this I, stuff in the show notes. <laughs> I see I see that I see. <laughs> I see that while you were not, while you were not sitting in the space pod, you were living it up in the airport lounge. Oh God! Okay, come All right. on. I need to explain myself now. You do the crime. You do the time. <laughs> um, flying back from Alabama. I can't believe you brought this up now, man. I was going to slide right by this one. Um, <laughs> no chance. Flying, flying back from Alabama to London. I had the downside of flying standby, which is I left Alabama on Sunday night, but I was not able to get on a plane Sunday night to take me home. And mm-hmm. so I was I was stranded in uh, Washington, D.C. And for those of you who know, Washington Dulles Airport is one of the worst airports in the world. It is absolutely terrible. It, it, it's just it, the whole airport is designed to feel claustrophobic. It is a single, just unbelievably long tube. And I swear the ceiling must be only seven feet from the ground. It's just, (laughs) it's awful. And they have some problem for years now. I've gone in and out of, of Dulles. They have some problem with the heating system in this gigantic airport. And so as you walk between sections of this endless column, Some of the sections, it must be 85 degrees and steamy and tropical in. And then other sections, it's like an Arctic wasteland. And so (laughs) nowhere in the airport is even remotely comfortable to be. Plus, there's the claustrophobia feeling everywhere. And they have the worst selection of shops ever. And it's just, it's a terrible, terrible airport. I just, I don't Mm -hmm. understand why it hasn't been burned to the ground and they just start over because it's awful. So? So I was looking forward to about seven hours in one of my least favorite airports in the world. Mm, That's a long time. It is a very long time because I'm not the panicky person that I am. I'm not going to go do anything in D.C. because then I have to, you know, strategize about when am I going to get back. And there's always a possibility that flights change and things. So I need to be near the airport anyway. So I had basically a full working day in the airport. And Mm -hmm. I remembered a comment that you said on the last podcast, which wouldn't Mm -hmm. have crossed my mind otherwise, so I blame this entirely on you, which is that some of the lounges at the airports, you can pay to get into the lounge. And you cannot do, what I was confused about is, you cannot do this with the first class lounges. Those are are for just the billionaires who care not about money. But for the rest of us, you can purchase a day pass to some of those lounges. And I thought, I have seven hours in this god-awful airport I would never normally do this, but I'm going to buy one of these passes today. And so I did. And so I spent most of the day in a somewhat comatose state, just sitting in front of a big window and watching airplanes take off and watching the ground crew do stuff in a relatively comfortable environment. So that was a little airport lounge experience. But I'm going to blame it on you because I wouldn't have done it if you hadn't mentioned it last time. And I wouldn't have done it. Millionaire jokes aside, would you do it again? Like, was it good advice? If I had. What would be my cutoff point? I think I think if I had three and a half or more hours at Dulles, I would buy the pass again. Mm-hmm. I think that that is the point at which it makes sense. Less than three and a half hours, it starts becoming, this is just uh, like, I'm not sure this is entirely worth it. But Dulles is really awful. So it would also depend on, on how tolerant I'm feeling of the world in general. But I think that's that's the cutoff point. So. Anyway, my fl- my flight back from Chicago got delayed by four hours. Were you just on the runway? Uh, no, I okay. was in inside. They did, they hadn't put us on the plane, but they were fixing like the brakes or something. Oh, I hate it when there's a mechanical thing. I start getting mm. nervous about the plane. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you've been on a plane where they had a mechanical thing and you're flying over the ocean, I mean, it's already hard not to think about the the black abyss of water that awaits for you below the airplane. It's extra difficult when you know you're on a plane that they just maybe barely fixed a few hours <laughs> ago. Uh, yeah. Oh, 
ah, I get vertigo sometimes just even thinking about what is beneath the airplane, especially when it's over water. That's no good. Because on land, you have a chance. On land, you have a chance. On water, nothing but death awaits you if you crash in the middle of the ocean. It's just, it's just over. Over if you're lucky. Uh, quickly. Not, you know, it could take days. Sorry. <laughs> I, sorry, I, just, I didn't mean to keep going on like that. I was trying to I thought I, I thought I was the morbid plane crash guy. You're, you're, you're encroaching on my territory there. This is, a, this is a personal fear. You are interested in the deaths of others. I am interested in avoiding my own death. And on an airplane, it, you know, it is obviously it is, it is shockingly safe air travel. But there is that, that situation of you have no control. Sometimes I find my mind wandering towards the pilots and thinking, I wonder if he got a lot of sleep last night? Or what if that pilot just had a divorce and he wants to kill himself and he's going to take all of us down with him? What could we do under that situation? Not very much. Not very much at all. No. Uh, and so you just, you know, you start thinking about all the worst case scenarios, plus mechanical failure, all right. plus dying of exposure in the water. Anyway. I hope you're enjoying your flight, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was watching uh, a Louis C.K. special the other day on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was the one called Hilarious. Mm-hmm. And and he was talking about people who complain about having their flights delayed and how angry that makes him. Mm-hmm. Because they're like, oh, I was delayed by two hours and they get really moany and whiny. And he just wants to turn around and say to them, you were flying like in a tube at hundreds of miles an hour through the sky and mm-hmm. you magically got from one place to another. That would have taken weeks or months in the past. Mm-hmm. And you're complaining about a few hours delay. And that has made me... A little bit cautious at the moment about complaining about my four-hour delay, and apparently I get I get some kind of refund or something from the airline if I go to a website that I have not yet gone to. <laughs> I should do that. Was, yeah, you're gonna get right on that. Uh, if I kept lists, I would put it on a list. <laughs> <laughs> that's ex- that's exactly why they make you do a thing before the refund. They know almost everybody doesn't do the thing. That's that's why you have to do a thing. They don't just give. I it must to you. do that. I must do that. Yeah, if they just came out and like just like gave you a few 20s, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, but, but that's not what they're yeah. going to do. <laughs> no, and it will be vouchers to have to fly with them again, no doubt. Yeah, that's that's almost certainly what you're going to get. Mm. And they never upgrade me. I'm terribly sorry. And it's your, and it's your mum's airline. Oh, yeah? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see what we can do about that. Spoiler alert, we won't be able to do anything. <laughs> well, I'm hoping maybe you can. My mate, my mate had my best man changed to his, like, family thing so he could fly him to my wedding but you can only change it once every six months or something who your designated person is yeah there's a whole bunch of limits on that and it's not gonna happen brady but uh, your parents quite like me don't they (laughs) okay okay so i visited my parents for a week before the alabama thing and my parents are probably listening right now because I swear. We're not actually not actually right now, but yeah, but but listening to it, listening to the recorded thing. Yeah, I swear, one of the most popular topics of conversation in the house was how much they love Brady and how great <laughs> Brady is on the podcast. It was nothing but a whole bunch of love for Brady, and also a whole bunch of concern about Audrey and Lulu, and they were just super into how great Brady is. It was really, it was a strange experience to be their son and to feel like, let's talk about Brady some more. <laughs> so, do they, uh, I mean, clearly, this is clearly they have never met me, or they would think very differently, but do they not ask about... Like, do they not ask about you? And like, do they not say, oh, I, I love that little joke you made or that was a really good point you made on the podcast? Or... Uh, okay, so to give, you, to give you an example of the kind of comment that I had while I was home. Mm. My mother said numerous times that you are really likable and she wanted to know why I could not be more likable <laughs> like Brady. <laughs> she goes, everybody <laughs> likes Brady, not everybody likes you. <laughs> That's clearly not true. She's she's obviously not reading the Reddit comments. <laughs> she's reading the. She's, I think she's reading the reviews on iTunes, which uh, are are very pro Brady and then sometimes pro me, sometimes anti me. But that's okay. That's okay. But anyway, the point is, they love and adore you. So I may very well actually find myself without any standby tickets the next time I try flying because all of them have been given to you. That might be the case. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to drive a wedge between you and your family, but I, I probably would for standby tickets. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> also, you might have to cut this next bit out. Uh-huh. 
because I'm going to specifically thank your dad for giving me those Harry's razor blades. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I know he what I know he made a big deal about it not being a big deal. Uh huh. Because like for those who don't know, I can't get my Harry's razor blades here in the UK yet because they're not delivering here. But Gray's dad got me a secret stash and sent them with Gray, and they were waiting for me. And they were given to me on the condition that I not thank him or email him or do anything because sounds like he's a pretty humble guy. Well, well, t- yeah. T- two th- two things about this. One, yeah. I will take this moment to point out that there were no presents waiting for me when I came home, but there was a <laughs> present that I was supposed to deliver to you. So and my parents know how much I hate carrying extra stuff in my <laughs> luggage. But this was, no, no, you need to bring these to Brady because we really like him. Um, and, and, and the second thing is that my, my family, we haven't really done gifts for birthdays or holidays for a very long time. Uh, mm. and it's just because we're not... As a whole family, we're not a real we heart stuff kind of family. Uh, yeah. So we, we don't have a whole bunch of needs. And so then trying to buy stuff for a bunch of other people who also don't want anything makes for a difficult holiday. And so everybody yeah. was a lot happier when we decided, you know what, let's just get together instead of doing all of these things. As a result of this, if my parents do give a gift, they feel like they don't want to burden the other person with having to now thank them. So that's why my father was very insistent that if I give you these razor blades, I need to make it clear how things work in this family. And it is that you have no obligation to send him a thank you and that he will probably be slightly annoyed if you send him a thank you because you are wasting your time. All right. Well, then I'm (laughs) going to say, Mr. Gray, I have no comment on those razor blades you sent whatsoever. I'm just going to I'm just going to be silent on the matter. (laughs) Although if your family has this kind of, if no one likes getting presents and gifts, Mm -hmm. but these holidays exist as a sort of a gift giving time, why don't you start a new tradition of everyone in your family buying me a gift? (laughs) You always want the things. You you want my million subscriber button. You want Uh, gifts from my parents. I think we need to start setting some boundaries, Brady. (laughs) I don't know. I got, I've got a present. I've got the present from your family. I think your gold button's next. Maybe not. That's good. Maybe, maybe I'm pushing my luck. Let's move on. <laughs> you, you, you did write something here about Irish US passport design. What's all that about? When I first saw some of the images for the redesign of the US passport, I thought they were a joke. I did not think that they were real. And what they made me think of was there's a section on Reddit called... Uh, America. So it's America. Yeah, R slash America. Are you familiar with America? Vaguely, yes. Yeah. yeah. So it is a kind of a, a jokey section where it's a super hyper patriotic pretend place where people yeah. will post uh, photoshopped images of, for example, Abe Lincoln holding the US Constitution while riding a bear on the moon and shooting space Nazis. Yeah, right. so that, America. Yeah, it'll just say America across the top with a big exclamation mark. So it is, it's kind <laughs> of making fun of a particular sort of hyper patriotism that is a real thing in America. Uh, I know. Well, when we went to that Alabama football match and they were playing a national anthem, they were showing like a fighter jet on the, sc- <laughs> on the, on the screen, on the TV screen. So we're singing the national anthem, looking at a, a fully laden missile carrying fighter jet. Yeah. America. Yeah, that's that's exactly it, right? So so when I saw the redesign, I honestly thought, oh, this looks like something from America. Like, is this a prank that people are pulling to try to, to make it <laughs> seem like this is the, the passport redesign? Because when you open up the passport, there are just uh, on all of the pages where there are supposed to be clear spaces for stamps. So I don't know, maybe you could see the stamps in the various places that you've gone. No, <laughs> there are these full color pictures of all kinds of hyper patriotic American stuff, like uh, Abe Lincoln riding yeah. the bear. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, you know it'll it, it's like monuments and fields of grain and mountains and I don't know space rockets, like all kinds of America. I think one of them is uh, Neil Armstrong on the moon. Now, undoubtedly, these are all you know great things that are American, but the design of them on the passport, it just it looks <laughs> terrible. It's just. It's too much, right? It's too much. Dial it down. I need to dial it down. Especially for a passport because it's a bit like, oh, well, now I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to put stamps on this, right? 
And then, like this. Really? This why is, would you, why why would you leave America? Yeah, I guess you would never leave America. You you know you're just gonna have this as an object of adoration, uh, this passport. <laughs> and the worst one, which always kind of makes me laugh, is when you open up the passport. <laughs> to the to the page that you're supposed to show the dude uh, when you're going into a country, the top of it is this huge eagle. It's this big eagle face, and <laughs> I always, every time I open up that passport, I think it should make the little <laughs> sound, right? Like the screaming <laughs> eagle sound, just like those those birthday cards that open up and start playing music. I'm honestly surprised that they didn't put a little sound effect in there for when you open up the passport. It just it just looks unreal. It just like this can't possibly be the actual design, but it is, uh, and so. <laughs> I kind of think it's terrible, but it is also like, well, I guess this is America. You know, America, not known for her subtlety. Yeah, so I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of the redesigned passport. But I got that one a few years ago and then just barely, like days before I was supposed to leave for this trip, uh, I got my Irish passport in the mail. And I think they have done exactly what the American passport has done, except in a nice, subtle way. So it's the same Mm. thing where on the passport stamp pages, there are Irish designs, scenes from Irish history or physical locations in Ireland. But they know how to do it because it's sort of two-tone green, where the, the pages are a light green and then the designs are a slightly darker green, maybe with a little blue to to as an accent color. But it looks like something that you could put a stamp on and then the stamp would be clearly visible. It doesn't mm-hmm. look like the pages are supposed to be the thing like it does in the American passport. So I'm going to give it. Like a, it, it is like a fraud prevention uh, thing, isn't it? These pages and designs. And so the, there is it's not it's there is method to the madness, but it can just be done in a more dialed down way. Yeah, it doesn't. You, you don't have to have it like full color paintings of people yeah. on the moon or <laughs> fields of grain. Uh, you know, it's just or the Liberty Bell or, you know, I don't know. It just it. Anyway, I'm going to give a thumbs up to the Irish passport. I think it looks very nice. And yeah. I, I, I kind of like a thumbs down to the U.S. passport, but also just like an inevitable sigh. Like, well, I guess it couldn't be anything else. Could it? America. Yeah. This is yeah. just what it was going to be. So anyway, that's the U.S. passports, Irish passports. I mean, uh, this is not a good day to be talking to me about passports because I have not told you about the palaver I have been through today involving passports. Oh, yeah. Oh, is, is this, is this is. for... Uh, so, <laughs> well, since you have been traveling for like five weeks, you're mm. back in the UK for what, four days? Is that right? Uh, yeah, like, yeah, some short amount of time. And then you are going straight to India. Is that right? Well, well, I'm supposed to be. This is now in some doubt. Oh, yeah? Because basically I require a visa to go to India. Mm-hmm. And you have you have to be in the UK to apply for your visa. So I couldn't have done this in advance. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you have much experience with Indian bureaucracy. Do you know how hot India is? I'm never going to India. <laughs> I, I, I love the people of India and I'm very thankful to any of them who watch my videos or listen to this podcast. But mm-hmm. your bureaucracy is not one of my favorite things. Mm-hmm. I, I have this. I've been a few times before. It always causes problems mm-hmm. and it's caused me Tremendous problems today to the point where I doubt I will get my visa in time for the flight on Sunday, which is already paid for. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But I, w- I don't know. I think, uh, do you know what? I'm going to edit this before we even start and I'm not going to tell, tell you the story because it's just, <laughs> it's a little bit too. Uh, it's first too much. World. It's yeah. too much. <laughs> But 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 the highlight. But there was one highlight which will appeal to you. I like that. Was, I like that. Whatever. Now I'm really curious. Like, what is the story that is two first world problems for our podcast, which is basically first world problems? Yeah, exactly. I'll exactly. have to ask you offline about this one. But my curiosity is now piqued. <laughs> but but the but the but the, the 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 moment you will enjoy was when I was in the. I went to Birmingham, which is a city in the UK, as most people would know. I went to Birmingham, which is where I had to do this. For various reasons, I was told I couldn't apply in Birmingham because I live in a part of England where they don't accept Birmingham, uh, where they don't accept applications. So anyway, I said, "Well, I'm here now. So what are we going to do about this?" And it turns out, by chance, I I, I did have uh, an address in another part of England that I could use, and they said, "All right, you can use this other address. You can put your application in here, but you're going to have to refill out the form." And I couldn't like it had to be typed and everything. I couldn't just cross it out and put a different address. They said, "You're going to have to." 
redo the whole form, retype it all online. And I'm like, oh, for goodness sake. All right. Well, where can I do that? And they said, well, four blocks that way is a library you can go to. So I was sent to this library, like in the middle of nowhere, where I then walked in and like had to book a computer and then sit down and refill out this form that I had filled out the night before, retyping it all. It then the computer then crashed and I had to do it a third time. And then I had to pay my thirty pence to print it out on the <laughs> library computer. How frustrating. Walk, walk walk back to the this centre, get another number and get in the queue again. And every time I went up to the counter, there was some other little tiny piece of minutia that had to be done. Oh, now we need you to fill out a declaration saying what cameras you're going to take to the country. Oh. So so I then had to go and get a scrap of paper and I hand wrote, I am Brady Harron and I will take a Canon C100 and two microphones. And, and in the end, I gave them all these pieces of paper. And then they were like, okay, this will take three to four working days to process. And I'm like, well... I'm flying on Sunday and it's Thursday. We have two working days. Can I can I pay you an extortionate amount of money <laughs> to have you do it sooner? Mm-hmm. And they were like, no. Nah. <laughs> oh God, that's a good bureaucracy. <laughs> no, if you were applying for a business visa, you could you could do the same day service, but you have to apply for a journalist visa because you will be filming something while you were there. There's no flexibility anywhere. There's no and India is just so. It's like the Indian bureaucracy in the UK reflects India itself. It's just huge and unwieldy and mm-hmm. uh, inflexible. And and in the end, I just walked out and said, all right, well, I'll try and pull some strings, which I've been trying to do today, but it's not going to happen. I'm not going to get this visa. I'm not going to be on this plane. I'm going to be letting a few people down. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's going to happen, but it was just... <sighs> I think it the Indian just... bureaucracy is letting a few people down. Yeah, and it's like, and it's this weird mix of super low tech and trying to be super high tech. So mm-hmm. they've got this terribly designed website that breaks all the time, and uh, and they're going through some transition at the moment. And I don't, I've talked about it enough. It was it was a bad experience, and it's always a bad experience. And I love the people of India, and you have a nice country, and you're very good at cricket. <laughs> but you are really bad at processing visas and make it very difficult to come and visit your country. I'm um, I'm sorry to hear that you won't be able to continue your crazy travel extravaganza. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to get the visa on Monday or Tuesday and go later and miss some of this conference? Who knows? Who knows? Who cares? Only me. The listeners don't. Hello, Internet. Today's sponsor is Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. This time I'm going to pick an old favorite of mine that I was actually rereading on this trip, which is The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Audible has just about everything, so of course they have this selection as well, and I think this is a good time of year to read it. It almost feels like a kind of Thanksgiving-y, Christmas-y sort of book. And it is also well-placed because, of course, the next Hobbit movie is coming out soon, and you're going to want to know the real story before you watch that very long, very extended, possibly very boring conclusion to the series so far. So if you have not read it already, now is an excellent time to listen to The Hobbit, the real version of the story. So if you want to listen to a free copy of The Hobbit, you can do so when you sign up at audible.com slash hello internet, so they know that you came from us, and you also get a 30-day free trial of Audible. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles and virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Once again, get your free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at audible.com slash hello internet. Let's talk about a place that was easy to go to, and that was Alabama, where we went and hung out with our friends and had a fantastic time. Did we not have a great trip to Alabama? I, I have to say it was an amazing experience. Uh, it was. I was I was very happy to go. And I feel like the five of us are, we get along very well. I feel like we've, we've clicked <laughs> yeah. since the very first time that we met up in, uh, up in Canada yeah. at the Perimeter Institute. To a certain extent, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't mind a good argument about things. But that's but that's part of the clicking, right? Is is yeah. you can have yeah. an argument with somebody, Derek, and and you you don't feel <laughs> like 
you're hurting each other's feelings. Or at least that's true. Or at least I, I don't think Derek feels that way. I don't know. I mean, maybe <laughs> no. I made him cry in his room at night or something. But I feel like I had nothing but love to express to Derek, even if we're arguing a whole bunch. Well, he's the one doing the arguing, so I hope he's not going back and crying <laughs> in his room. He he makes me look lovely when it comes. <laughs> and I and I think I'm a pretty argumentative guy. I think I think we're all argumentative in our yeah. own way and we're all we're all very particular in our own way and, and but I, you, I like i still think we we just get along really well and so that's why when destin first arranged this it was like i i will come i will make time in my schedule for this you know no no questions asked and even though it was absolutely exhausting if destin said oh I, you know i want to try to arrange this again for next month i i would be on board without a doubt it's like, i would i would yeah. go quite happily uh, even, even though it'll probably take me a, a week to recover from the trip, uh, it was it was glorious. It was absolutely glorious. Do you know what's most exhausting about hanging out with you guys? What? And you're not as guilty of this as some of the others, but this is just a thing. You don't get away with anything. Like, like if you misspeak or like mispronounce something or use a bit of hyperbole you shouldn't or say something that is incorrect, which happens all the time, like, you know, normally when you're talking to normal people and they say something like, and you know, like, you know, they don't need correcting either because they don't need correcting or because they just misspoke and they know the correct information. You just kind of let that go. Like, you just don't say anything. That That's what normal people do. That doesn't happen when we're hanging out. Like, if you say something wrong or like whether, whether, whether by mistake or just misspeaking, you're gone, man. That's not good. That's not just going to slide by. These are these are these are these are guys who enjoy accuracy. Yes, that is that is definitely true. And Destin was busy telling us a whole bunch of local stories about Huntsville and the various places that he was taking us. And Derek <laughs> was right behind him with his iPhone, fact checking the stories he as they were being told. <laughs> he was too. <laughs> on yeah, De- Des- yeah, like Desmond say, "Oh, that's this place is fam- This place is famous for being, yeah, that you know, the 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 tallest the tallest tree south of the Mississippi or something." And then Derek would be, "Well, actually, there are. It's the third tallest." And yeah. that same kind of personality trait is also why I just absolutely adore hanging out with you guys whenever I get the chance. Uh, and, and I think what what really set things off on the right foot was when. Derek uh, and Destin were picking me up from the airport. I think, I, yeah, so I was the second person to arrive. And so they picked me up from the airport. We've done the initial, oh, hi, how are yous? And we're not in the car three minutes before hmm. all of us are having a conversation about how the highway numbering system works, how the interstate <laughs> highway numbering system works. And I thought, I love this. This doesn't happen with anybody else. Everybody else, there'd be like this whole big boring, how was your trip? How did things go? Sort of like we started the podcast with, right? Yeah. <laughs> but with them, it's like you can almost guarantee that any conversation is going to turn both very interesting and super nerdy really fast because <laughs> somebody knows something about something or other and you, you just you know among the five of us you just need someone to make a, an offhanded comment and boom we're, we're in deep on how the highway numbering system works or what are the editing rules for wikipedia or just a numerous other topics that mm. came up and that is why i absolutely love hanging out with you guys uh and it was just it was just great but it is it is kind of mentally exhausting uh after a whole week Especially, especially for someone like me who barely socializes, who puts the socializing light bulb at the dimmest it can possibly be without being off. And then to suddenly have six days in a row of 18-hour days of talking to people it is quite draining from my perspective, but totally worth it. I'll tell you what was totally worth it for me. Yeah. And this is, this is going to make people jealous because this is what I got to see while I was away with Gray. I got to see Gray wielding all manner of guns and handguns <laughs> and AK-47s and just firing those bad boys at targets. And I think you loved it. Yeah, we we uh, we had a kind of special morning with Destin where uh, D- Destin was asking, Destin, when he arranged this, asked people various things that, that they might want to do. And so there was a whole bunch of options. And one of those options was to learn how to fire a gun. Hmm. And... I had never fired a gun in my whole life. And I was thinking later, it is quite possible that I had never 
touched an active firearm in my life. You know, something that is outside of a museum. Touch the gun. Touch the gun, Gray. It, it, it was one of these things where I thought, well, I, I've, never, I've never done this before. And I know and very much respect how very serious Destin is about gun safety. This is no joke. We've had some conversations about it. He, he takes this stuff very, very seriously. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. I thought, well, I'm never going to go to a gun range just on my own and to have some dude I don't know tell me about guns. So I, th- I, I looked at Destin and I thought, that is the man I'm going to lose my gun virginity with. And he was very gentle and it was a great experience. <laughs> it was good. It's like he gave, he gave us a little lesson on each gun before we used it on how it worked. And then he gave us a little safety briefing on each one. And then basically he said, go on then. And we yeah. loaded those bad boys up and bang, bang, bang. <laughs> yeah. But... It was so much fun seeing seeing you who like I don't know like like it was fun for all of us and we all mm. had a good time but there was something particularly amusing to me about seeing you firing especially those 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 handguns. I don't see why there's anything amusing about that. I don't. I don't, I don't think... know. I don't know. It was just like I don't know. It was just the. It was just a funny sight. The the thing that I have to say that was most surprising about that again someone who's just never shotguns has no experience with this is. When it started out, Destin set up a bunch of little orange targets, and I want to say that the first ones were maybe 40 or 50 meters away. I don't know. Is that fair? I have a hard time estimating distances. It depends on the story you're going to tell about how far away I'm going to say they were. <laughs> <laughs> the far away ones, I think 50 meters. Yeah. 40 yeah. or 50 sounds about fair. Okay. Uh, and, and Destin came out and he said, oh, don't worry, you're going to be hitting these little you know, 10 centimeter across targets in no time. And I thought, no way, buddy. Do you know how mm. far away that is? It looks like a dot on my field of vision. I, mm. I would need to train for years to hit one of those targets. And yeah. much to my surprise, guns are designed to make it easy to shoot things accurately. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, as long as I'm not moving around too much, and if I can line up the, the sights with the target... I actually have a decent chance of hitting something that seems way too far away to actually hit. So that, it's that not was like, it's not it's not like Angry Birds where you've got to like arc it through the air. The bullet's going to go in a pretty straight line the whole way. Yeah, honest to God, that was kind of what I was thinking. Is like, well, you know, <laughs> it's going to take a long time, and I, I'll need to get a feel for the gun. No, nope, they're designed to shoot things accurately, and so if you if someone teaches you how to use it you can hit things relatively accurately. Now, I'm not saying I hit every one of the targets, but I was surprised that I hit any of the targets. I, I, was, I was genuinely shocked. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, Gray did not hit that many of the targets. Uh, but that's what I mean. <laughs> I am surprised I hit any of them. I, I, I thought there's no way we could be here for weeks before I would hit one of those targets. But no, uh, you know, it, it, it was, nah. it was uh, quite remarkable. So Yeah, you were knocking them off. And you even knocking a few off with the handgun, which was pretty impressive. That was, uh, that was a fun Alabama experience. Without, did, without you have a, did you have a favorite uh, weapon? Well, I think we both had a favorite weapon. So I like the, the P-22 uh, handgun, and I don't remember what the name of yours was, but uh, yours seemed know. very. I liked lots of them. I I tended to like the one I was holding at the time the most, <laughs> and it was like, oh, I can't imagine one being more enjoyable than this. But and you then... know the one I'm talking about. The it was like the six shooter one. Oh yeah, the uh, what's it called? Is it a, something forty five special or something? I think it's, I think that's right. This this is show the listeners how much we know about this. <laughs> Des- Destin will be screaming at his. A podcast app right now. I'm going to look up what it was called so I get it right. Yeah, I did like that one. It was something special. Uh, I think that's 45 right. special. That yeah. sounds right. That was pretty cool. Although, no, that's not right because it's not calling up many pictures. I don't know. It was that revolver. No, I also liked that one that f- when we fired the dragon breath at the end that had a real big kick to it. I like that one that was like an. The shotgun? You mean the shotgun? Yeah, but the one that was kind of an AK-47 version of a shotgun. Ah, okay. I liked, I liked this is one of these things where it is difficult to describe, but there were just so many guns. <laughs> it was, there was a, there, what's, the, what's the collect, an arsenal of guns? Is that the yeah. collective name? There was just this table of guns of all yeah. various sizes and shapes. It's not like, oh, we can't remember the names of the two guns. 
The, the, you yeah. know, we we must have fired ten different kinds of guns, uh, yeah. you know, at, at least. So it was it was definitely a, it was a very memorable experience. I I enjoyed it a lot. And yeah. uh, if you ever have to learn about gun safety, I would highly recommend Destin as the man to do it with. He was very serious and yeah. also very very accepting as a teacher. When I would do something dumb, like try to shoot with the safety on, you know, or yeah. just like other just idiotic things. So he was yeah. he was very good. He was excellent and. Um, in in true style, we did spend the hour driving to the site talking about gun laws and stuff in the US. <laughs> so so we had this big like heated debate about the, pr- the pros and cons of gun laws and where we all stood on it. Mm-hmm. And then basically we got out of the car and said, "All right, let's load them up." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which was kind of which was kind of funny, but anyway, it was a good experience and it was done very safely and mm-hmm. uh, we were very grateful for it. Yes, we had a we had a. a we had a great dinner with his parents that night too. What mm. what wonderful people all his family were. They were so kind and nice and Tara, his wife, organising everything and we they were so good. Um I feel really bad that they were so nice. <laughs> I can't I can't imagine I could ever be that nice a host. Well this, this is exactly I, I I struggle to put into words Destin's family. It's almost like they are the perfect family out of a Disney movie. The whole extended <laughs> family. Everybody is really great. Everybody is really polite, and everybody is really nice. And it was it was mm. honestly just overwhelming. And I always I always find it you know because I come from a pretty small family. I always find it really interesting to see other people's families and and how they interact. And I, I have to say this was just a a great big family, and it was uh, it was quite an experience, and we felt really welcome the whole time. And yeah, it was. I was just overwhelmed. But perhaps the the most important and the uh, one of the great discoveries from Destin's family was a a delicacy <laughs> that, that was prepared for us on multiple occasions, and it was prepared for us on one occasion and for you explicitly. I think on several other occasions. <laughs> I think and, that's the way it went. And I, and I'm not going to describe it because. You will accuse me of um, exaggerating. Do you want to describe this delicacy, which apparently is a bit of a family tradition in Destin's family, and I thought was the finest dessert I have ever encountered? <laughs> okay, so this this tray appears one of the evenings. A uh, huge tray as well, yeah. like the size of a dinner table. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, this tray <laughs> appears, and it looks like it is just strawberries on the top in a little bit of strawberry sauce, but there is a surprise underneath. Which is that's like Jello. It's like set in Jello. Isn't yeah, it? Like yeah. It's, it, it's kind yeah. of like Jello on the top of strawberries, but but very yeah. intense strawberry flavor. Yeah. But underneath the layer of strawberries, there is a layer of whipped cream, which mm. is like okay, okay. So far, so good. I can understand this. This you know this yeah. is this is understandable. Uh, but then the bottom layer is crunchy pretzels, which doesn't <sighs> seem like it fits with the other two, and. We ended up having a big argument over how to quantify the tastiness of this dessert, <laughs> <laughs> which again, sounds ridiculous when I say it out loud, but this really was like an hour of our evening was arguing over on a one to 10 scale, how delicious is this dessert? And you were taking a very strong nine, possibly 10 stance. On no, this no, I never said 10. I was, I was going nine and then I may be downgraded to eight just to leave myself some wiggle room. But the thing that disappointed me was some of the others were quite, gave it too low a mark, basically. <laughs> and the whole time they were giving it this, this too low a mark, they were just downing the stuff by the bowl. <laughs> H- Henry must have had three bowls of the stuff. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was one of the real discoveries of my trip to Alabama. Yeah, well, all of the food in Alabama was delicious. Now, as the listeners may guess, I am a relatively picky eater. I don't like to try <laughs> new foods. I like things real consistent, especially if it's going in my body. <laughs> but I have to say Alabama was probably one of the only places on earth I have ever been where I felt like, whatever, just order the food. At one restaurant, I even delegated the power of my order to Destin, which is something I would never do. Anywhere on earth, under any circumstance. But I was like, you know what? I have been here four days. Everything is delicious. I don't have any idea what to order on this menu. You just do it, dude. And he ordered a whole bunch of stuff. And I was like, this is all delicious. This is all amazing. (laughs) So Alabama, thumbs up on your food. I gained five pounds in a week from eating everything. It was just, it was amazing. But I could not live there because 
I would obviously die of some kind of obesity-related disease if I spent two or three years down in Alabama. So excellent place to visit, but I could not possibly live there because the food is too good. So, I mean, the main reason we went was just to hang out with friends and we, we did this shooting and we ate this yummy jello and we went into a cave and we went to a football match and we did this amazing like tour of NASA, the Marshall mm-hmm. Space Center that was arranged. But another big thing we did, of course, was the random acts of intelligence show at the rocket center which mm-hmm. 600 people came to yeah well to, to back this up to back this up i have a couple lessons about destin the first right. we've already mentioned on i think one of the extras to this podcast which is do not discuss potential titles for videos with destin unless you have a full working day to give over to that project. Yeah. So you, you will be engaged in this conversation for forever <laughs> and the other lesson that i learned on this trip is do not agree to do something with Destin on the premise that it is going to be small. (laughs) Destin can only do things all the way. And so I went back and looked at the old emails and it started as, oh, hey, let's let's have this trip just together in Alabama and we're just going to hang out and isn't that going to be great? And then Over time, it progressed to, hey, maybe we should have an informal meetup in a park with some people who might want to uh, meet up with us if we just say something on Twitter. And then it was, oh, maybe we could do at a university, like a little panel. And then it kept ratcheting up in this way when I wasn't (laughs) paying close enough attention to all of a sudden, I felt like I did not understand the full scale of this thing until I was actually in Alabama and it was tomorrow. (laughs) I was like, oh, we have the Space and Rocket Center and there's going to be a Saturn V rocket above us and there's going to be 600 people and there's a huge screen and there's audio visual checks to be done it just turned into this enormous thing so, and we were like greeted by like the local tourist authority it was like <laughs> it was like a big deal like yeah the whole thing was just crazy and i kept thinking i don't remember signing up for any of this <laughs> i don't exactly know how i got here and it is somewhat nerve-wracking to see how real this thing is i if 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 that had been presented to me at the start I would have said, no way. Are you crazy? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but somehow, Destin just kept ratcheting it up a little bit, a little bit over the months. And you never say no at any particular point. And suddenly you find yourself on stage in front of 600 people uh, for the first time. So, yeah. But it, it was, uh, again, it was a great event. But it was surprising how much effort Destin was able to put into it and how well, he was able to pull off the whole thing when it started as just a, like, oh, maybe we'll do a thing. So, yes. You know how, like, I was joking before about how if I was flying first class, I'd want Scarlett Johansson giving me peanut M&Ms and all this sort of stuff. If I was going to put on a show and I was joking around and you said, where do you want your stage to be, Brady? I would say to you, all right, here's the stage I want, Gray, make this happen. I want a Saturn V rocket above my head, suspended from the ceiling. And then I would say, I want an Apollo, a real Apollo lunar landing module and lunar rover to my left. I want a real Apollo return capsule that brought men back from the moon to my right. In fact, put a moon rock there as well while you're at it. I want... I want Apollo memorabilia in every corner. I want the parachute from an Apollo lunar module sitting above my right shoulder. Make that happen. And you would laugh at me. I would. I would. And that is exactly what we had. Yeah. Yeah. It was like it was like Brady fantasy stage. The 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 only thing that would have been more amazing was if halfway through Scarlett Johansson appeared and started giving me peanut M and M's, <laughs> or she gave that... you a Speedmaster. That's what she Scarlett Johansson oh, yeah. comes up. And gives well, they a well they did they did bring a Speedmaster on stage for me, so that part was covered. I guess they could have brought a tray of that pretzel jelly strawberry <laughs> stuff on stage. <laughs> that didn't happen during the show, but I did have some afterwards back at home. <laughs> yeah, it really was the perfect Brady stage. I have a hard time imagining that there will ever be a stage that you could love more than that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a- a- as is known this this was deliberately something we like you know didn't want to make a like a big recording of and like it was it this was a live show it wasn't mm. a, a video so i don't think we're gonna you know rabbit on for ages about what we did and and things like that because you know maybe would maybe this will happen again one day although i doubt it listening to <laughs> listening to some of your comments but 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 one thing that we should talk about because it's quite interesting is the fact that 
you were there. You were on stage. I mean, you don't make a big deal about public appearances and mm-hmm. plaster yourself all over your videos and post photos of yourself like the rest of us show offs. Mm-hmm. So this, so this was something a bit different for you. And I think, I think a fair proportion of people who were there were quite curious about seeing you uh, come out from your little editing cave and appear in public. How, mm-hmm. how was that experience for you? Yeah, I think, I think it, it, it felt, uh, it felt really. Natural. I almost feel like we couldn't talk a lot about the night because, from my perspective, it went so fast. It's a bit like, uh, mm. it's a bit like on one of the the previous podcasts I mentioned how oh I would have no memory of my wedding if it had not been recorded, and yeah. I do have b- memories of the Space and Rocket Center talk because obviously it was not as intense as my wedding was. That's a whole other level. But it was it was a very very intense evening still, and so it mm. felt like the thing just went by so fast. And there are little details that I remember about it, but it would almost be difficult to actually talk about the thing uh, in its entirety. But yeah, but yeah, I I I, I did appear in person uh, at this event, and yeah, I, I I think it went well. And afterwards, after the actual event itself, we ended up uh, all five of us ended up signing posters and T-shirts and stuff for. Uh, about two hours, I think. Uh, is, it was crazy. It, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. I was trying to estimate how many people it was, and I'm thinking, okay, I probably, probably saw something like two or three people a minute, and it was, you know, two hours of signing at the least, mm-hmm. and so that's something like what, 250 people at a minimum, maybe 400 mm-hmm. people at a maximum. I don't know. That's mm-hmm. a lot of people to to say hello to, <laughs> and uh, we had to sign iPhones. Oh man, that okay. was so that was that was I've never that was I did not expect that to happen. I did not expect that to happen either. And so so one so the setup here is that after the show we went out into the kind of lobby of the Space and Rocket Center, and it it felt just mobbed. There were just people everywhere, and uh, I ended up being in a corner with a kind of semicircle of people around me and just pulling people out and signing and saying hello and shaking hands and all this stuff. Like, that went really well. That w- that was really nice. But I do remember the first guy who came up to me and said, I want you to sign my iPhone. And I thought, dude, I don't know if I can handle this kind of pressure. And just to be clear, this is with a pen. Yeah, with a permanent on, like, marker. On, on the, the back of the yeah, phone. On the actual screen. iPhone. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, on, on, the, on the metal part on the back. Hmm. That, <laughs> was, that was strange. Yeah. I, like, I don't know if I can handle this. But I did say, okay, if you, you know, you look me in the eyes, man, and you tell me that you're really okay with this, I'm going to do it. And so he did, and I signed it. And I have to say, signing an iPhone is a very pleasurable experience. The back (laughs) is nice and solid. The pen moves nice and smoothly. Compared to signing something like a T-shirt, signing an iPhone is a total joy. So (laughs) I made this comment, and a bunch of people around heard this, and then I ended up, by my count, signing four iPhones in total <laughs> over that event because other people are like, oh, do you want to sign my iPhone? And I thought, well, <laughs> once you sign one, you know, you've broken through that isn't this terrifying barrier. Sure, I'll sign everybody's iPhone. This is way better than signing posters. I feel a bit bad about the one I signed because... Did you mess it up? Did you mess no, up that man's phone? No, no, I didn't mess it up. But I mean, obviously what happened was a lot of people sort of went around like to all five of us and just got them to sign things like a poster and stuff like that to have like the the collection of people who were there. Mm-hmm. But but the first time I was asked to sign the phone, and I was well aware that, you know, a lot of people were there not to see me. In fact, more people were probably there to see, you know, the Derricks and the Destins because they're like big superstars and the CGP Grey because he's a mystery man. No, Any, anyway, uh, that, that, that's uh, You make me Okay. Uh, no, okay. That, that's False aside. humility. That, okay, sorry. False humility. <laughs> False humility. Let me get back to my humble brag. So yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the thing, so this guy pulls out his phone and says, will you sign my iPhone? And I think I was the first person asked to do it because you obviously got a, a whole bunch of others after you made your comment, but this was like the first one I'd seen and, mm-hmm. and it, was, it was unsigned. And I was like, I said, like you said, I said, are you serious? You want me to sign your phone? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I do. So I was like, Oh, okay, yeah, sure, whereabouts. And he sort of pointed vaguely to an area. So 
I like I signed it and I signed it really big in the middle. <laughs> and it never occurred to me that he was gonna take that phone to be signed by the rest of you, which of course that should have occurred to me. Why would he just want me to sign it? Mm-hmm. So later on, when a picture was posted, like to Twitter or something, of the phone signed by everyone, there's kind of my giant signature in the middle. <laughs> and like there's CGP Gray and Derek and Destin all like you guys are all like on the edges on the writing and everything, and I've hogged the best spot. So So you are the John Hancock of that phone. Exactly. I, I hope I hope he came to me first because he wanted me most because I, because I am in the middle. <laughs> but uh, I tell you what, those few hours though, obviously it was very self-selecting, and these people had come because they wanted to see us. So, mm-hmm. but it did give you a taste for a couple of hours of what it must be like to be like like a well-known person, mm-hmm. and it made me realise like I loved I loved it talking to all these people and doing this, but I also liked that after two or three hours it stopped. Yes. And I can't imagine what it must be like to be like Brad Pitt or someone and just everywhere you go, that is the default. Yes, yes. This is this is a topic you know very well. I want to talk about more in detail at some point. But cool. but yes, yeah. I, I would I would reaffirm this that you know, people think being famous is awesome. And it's like, yes, it can be awesome for an afternoon. But yeah. if your whole life was like this, it's a nightmare. It would it would just be terrible. And so yes, it yeah. was it was really great that there was a group of people who wanted to come and that we could legitimately spend some time with those people. And even after the even after the the two hours of signing, we then went. There was like an after after show at the the Marriott where people were just having drinks. And so we went over there and just hung out, and it was really great to be able to kind of go around to some tables and just just have some chill conversations with people, uh, you know. Mm. And like that that was also a really a really nice experience. But I highly value in my normal life being able to just go somewhere and people don't know me. So yes, that, yeah. like this is great under limited circumstances, but it would not it would not be great in in the in your life in general. But I do have to like, say, and the reason why I wanted to shut you down before about people people uh, you know just not coming to see you, which was my experience was almost everybody who came, the very first thing that they mentioned was the podcast and how they listened to the two of us and they really liked it. And I, and I found that just very notable and very interesting that there was really strong Hello Internet listener uh, presence at the Random Acts event. And I, was. I, just, I thought that was really interesting and just lots of people saying how much they liked the podcast. And uh, yeah. yeah, it was, it, that was, that was one time I felt like, oh, this is, this is really nice. I'm glad people, I'm glad people yeah. like it. So I would have preferred it though, if they'd said like, I don't know who that, that CGP gray joker is, but I think number file <laughs> and periodic videos are just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was it was it was, uh, it was fun. You obviously um, posed for like loads of selfies and stuff like that yeah, with yeah. people, which was uh, and you know this is obviously these are going to just you know find their way around the places people share things like people do. Yeah, yeah. You're cool. You're cool with that. You've got no problem with you know because you you do value your privacy, but you've just sort of said, oh well, there we go. Well, so the the thing the thing about this is. As you might imagine, I have thought about this kind of decision for a while. Mm. And uh, yeah, I was, someone asked during the event if I was okay with pictures. And I said, yeah, so, you know, obviously it's, it's fine. So yeah, if you go on Twitter now, you can search for pictures of what I look like. I still recommend that you don't. Like I wrote mm. that article about uh, the faceless voices, laying out my reasons for, for, from my experience, lots of podcasts I listen to or audiobook narrators I listen to. I prefer to not know what they look like. Yeah. And so I wrote an article trying to tell people that. And I have actually received more than a few emails from people saying that they have regretted their decision to go find out what I look like. <laughs> and I, I understand that. I don't take that as as they're horrified by how horrifically ugly I am or anything. It's like, no, no, I get that. I completely understand that feeling of it's kind of better when you when you don't know the person. But for some yeah. but some some people really do want to know. And so if if you do, you can go on Twitter and and search for the pictures and I'm sure they'll you'll find them and they'll come up. But yeah, it, it was it was something that I was thinking about for yeah. a long time, and it was really really ever since I crossed the million subscriber mark, I I noticed that I was starting to have a lot of anxiety about trying to keep my picture off of the internet, which of mm. course is just an impossible task. And yeah. also, I, I, I am no fool. You look at the trend lines of technology, like. 
we are not heading into a world that is more private in the future. We are heading into a world that is less private in the future. Yeah. And so if you are a person who does any kind of work in the public sphere, you just you can't have the same kind of control over your anonymity that you you would as a normal person because even normal people have a difficult time with that. So I guess I was I was having a lot of just stress about trying to keep that tamped down and yeah. I also I also just want to say trying to keep pictures off the internet that was something that I was doing but there is also like this whole team of of other people who I have interacted with over the years who have also helped me with this and I cannot possibly name all of them but I do hmm. just want to say like my ability to keep my picture off of the internet was not a one man project there are a <laughs> lot of people who help me with this and and you know help take old stuff down or you know just just helped protect my anonymity in some way. So I do want to say just a huge thanks to all of the people who who did help with that. Like it 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 meant quite a lot to me. Hmm. After the million subscribers, I could I could feel the tide changing on this that there were just there was just too many people and so the, the it's again it's like economics with Greg. The 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 stress of trying to maintain this was beginning to outweigh the the personal benefits of yeah. the anonymity. In a perfect world, I would remain anonymous forever. But of course, that's not the world that we actually live in. And mm. so I thought, well, I, I have to do this in in at some point in some way. And then this is when Dustin started talking about doing an event. And I thought, oh, this this kind of works out perfectly. And I have to say, my experience now is that I am just hugely relieved to not be stressed out about this anymore um, because I, I used to just I used to just get kind of very anxious sometimes when people would send me emails that were something about my picture and I thought like oh god you know what is this what am I going to have to worry about now or yeah. you know just just like I am very happy to have that part of my life be over but sort of related to the fame thing like we mentioned before I, I still have a hard time imagining I'm ever going to be actively promoting me. Like, I don't think I'm going to be in my own videos. Uh, I like doing the animations and I think they work. And I probably won't put my own picture on my about page on my website. I did find, I mean, I did have a brief experience with this a few weeks back with the, um, with the pie, mile of pie video. Because mm -hmm. obviously, obviously you were there and found your way into various shots because you were helping out basically. Yeah, and yeah. I did, I did say to you, do you want me to go through with a fine tooth comb and take you out and censor you and you'd obviously had reached this decision already and you just said mm -hmm. to me look just just leave it so obviously there yeah was a I, I told i told you that i, I know i wouldn't yeah. be there if it wasn't yeah. okay for me to be in background yeah. shots because yeah. it, it like it wouldn't be fair for me to go to this thing and then tell you oh you have to spend an enormous amount of time and effort <laughs> making yeah. sure that you digitally erase me from every shot yeah but i did find it funny because and mildly creepy but also but more funny that obviously people figured this out because we talked about the video on, mm. on, a, on the podcast. And the lengths people went to on that video to sort of isolate who you were, like they would go through like the credits of who was who was there yep. and then like do this sort of process of elimination and they were taking screen grabs and they were using like aerial shots to figure out what you were wearing. It was like a it was like CSI. Yeah. And that like, and that, <laughs> that kind of that, stuff is is totally creepy. Like there's no way to look at that. And even though the people are have the best intentions, I like yeah. it. Just feels subjectively creepy, and mm. and so yes, I am very happy that for stuff like that in the future, if the conversation comes up where people go, "Oh, which one is CGP Gray?" Someone can just link to one of the pictures on Twitter and go, "That's CGP Look, Gray." If you must know, if you must know, there yeah. he is. It's this one, but we don't have we don't have to start like tracking down everybody who's appeared in this video. And yeah. putting them up on a on a cork board with strings connecting to different addresses <laughs> and stuff like we don't need to do that anymore. We just know, and it's fine. So I'm 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 uh, I'm uh, happy to have that situation be different now. I love that you went for the cork board and the strings, like the very ungray like way of doing it. That's kind of cute. <laughs> that's the way crazy people look in movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, they would have it like in 3D, and there'd be strings all across their room, and you wouldn't be able to walk through the room because they've done it all like yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hero style. <laughs> yeah. Although it is some people like, like, as you said, you were asked during the show, oh, do you mind if we, 
you know, post pictures and stuff. And you said, no. I mean, you jokingly said it was, I think you said like it was your coming out or something. Yeah, that yeah. Got, that, got, that got a nice laugh. Uh, and yet some people are still posting pictures from the event, like their selfies with you. And they're like censoring out your face. Like they're putting something, <laughs> maybe they don't like what you look like. Well, I, what I love about that, <laughs> I did not expect that. And I saw a whole bunch of people do that exact same thing where they posted the picture of them with me, but they took the they put the stick figure over my face. Yeah. It never occurred to me that people would do that. But I thought, oh, this is great because I can retweet these photos. <laughs> like look at these pictures from this event. Uh and so I have to say I really got a big laugh out of that. I really enjoyed that. And I think it's I just thought it was really funny. And and people did do funny things when when we were actually signing stuff. One guy wanted me to hold the poster over my face and took a picture of me holding you know, like him next to me with the poster over my face. Like, I'm not even sure what the point of this picture is, but I'm glad it makes you happy. Uh and there were just a, there were a few funny things like that. So I, I have to say I I I genuinely enjoyed the experience of of meeting everybody, no matter how briefly, in that signing section and and just talking to to fans of the show or people who like the videos. Like that was that was uh, a much better experience than I expected it to be. Uh, I expected it to just just be really draining, which it was. Hmm. But it, but I did not expect that it, it could also be as as fun as it turned out to be. And I, I hope it was fun for everybody who was there. And for those who couldn't make it or or would like to have made it, I'm sure one day something will happen where you two can take a photo of Gray's face covered with a poster. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's the ideal thing we, to do. We must we must make sure we do something again sometime one of these days because yeah. well, it I was hope, fun. Yeah, I, I hope Destin arranges something again. I'm just I'm just gonna delegate it to Destin to do. Oh <laughs> goodness knows what he'll do. He'll probably it'll probably be literally held on the moon next time. <laughs> you know he'll be like, oh, yeah, the, the you know the rocket center wasn't close enough to a lunar environment. This time I want to go all the way. That's a good point. I think maybe uh, maybe I will delegate the next one to Henry. Henry should arrange the next one. <laughs> Come on, listeners. You won the battle for me on freebooting. Now win the battle for me on Brea Cumble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cut that part out.